I am Laura Dixon, and you are listening to the Naturally Thin for Life podcast, episode number 67, What Makes Intuitive Eating Hard? Welcome to the Naturally Thin for Life podcast. I'm going to teach you how to get out of your diet brain so that you too can be naturally thin for life. No counting, restricting, or obsessing. I am going to take the mystery out of it for you so that you can become naturally thin starting today. Are you ready? Let's do this. Hello, friends. Welcome back to the podcast. There are a lot of misconceptions when it comes to intuitive eating and many that I had on my own journey. So today I'm going to walk you through what makes intuitive eating hard, especially when you've been dieting and you have a diet brain, and then the skills you need to learn to make intuitive eating easy. Intuitive eating is intuitive, hence the name. But when you've layered years of dieting on top of the innate way we were designed to eat, that is what makes it difficult. Before we dive in, make sure to subscribe to the podcast if you're loving it so that you are always getting the latest episodes. And if you could take a quick minute to leave a review and write a review, that would be amazing. When you leave and write a review, it helps the podcast know to suggest the podcast to other people. And I love imagining a world where we are all free from the obsession with our weight. And then we, by our example, can pass that on to our children and those around us. And this podcast is a big part of helping all of you. And I've heard from so many of you so much amazing progress that you've had. So Thank you for taking that minute to write a review and leave a review. And I know the women that haven't found the podcast yet also say thank you. Now, let's talk about intuitive eating and what it really is. Intuitive eating is listening to your body so that you eat when you're hungry, stop when you're satisfied, and the food you eat to satisfy your hunger fuels your body. It feels good in your body. It feels comfortable. Super simple, right? Like my three-year-old does this pretty effortlessly because it truly is intuitive. He doesn't think about this. It's not something that's on his mind all the time. It's so fascinating to watch him and my daughter, who she's a year and a half, to watch them both eat. We eat a variety of foods in our house and I'm pregnant right now. So what I eat is a little bit different than usual because some days I don't feel the best, especially in the evening and especially around dinner time. And earlier this week, we were eating steak, broccoli, and sweet potatoes. Now, both of my kids love all three of these foods. I've seen them down each type of these foods, the steak, the broccoli, and the sweet potatoes. And we often have these three foods for a meal together. Sometimes when we have the steak, the sweet potatoes, and the broccoli, my son Ben will only really eat the veggies. He'll only eat the broccoli and the sweet potatoes and maybe a bite or two of the meat. Then other times, he eats a lot of meat and hardly any vegetables. And my daughter does the same thing and not necessarily the same thing that he's doing. So he might be like really eating the broccoli and the sweet potatoes. And she's like, no, thanks. I'm good on that. I'll take the steak tonight. Their bodies balance out what they're eating. They really eat instinctually. And this relates to what I was talking about in the last episode, creating consistency. And then our bodies don't know that our brain thinks about food in 24-hour time periods. We totally made that stuff up. Meaning each 24-hour time period is not like a clean slate where we just start over again. Our body doesn't know that we're doing that. That's just something we learned when we're dieting. My son, Ben, his body intuitively balances out the food he eats within a much longer time period than 24 hours. So I think it's just so fascinating to watch them. And they do this where one day may be very vegetable laden. And then the next day they're like, "Hmm, not so much. Or maybe we're having a curry and they eat more of the curry than the rice. And then other days they might eat more of the rice than the curry. It's the same curry. So I know they like it, right? It's not about necessarily that they like it or they don't like it. They're so instinctually eating for what their body wants. And I also know they eat really intuitively and it feels really good in their body because they poop really easily and really consistently. So intuitive eating, meaning eating when you're hungry, 
eating food that serves you and stopping when you're satisfied is an innate skill. It's so innate that at a year and a half and at three years old, we just do this automatically without thinking about it. Here is what makes that difficult. It's really scientific. What makes it difficult is all the crap you learn growing up in our culture and especially when you diet. And yes, of course, there's some science behind all of this and we'll get to that in a minute, especially when it comes to your emotional well-being. But think about that year and a half old, that three-year-old version of you who eats really instinctually, eats really innately, and then all the shit we learn over the next couple of decades. How many of you were either kids who had parents that gave you food when you were being loud, or you maybe do that with your kids, right? It's so tempting. We can totally see why people do it, why our parents did it with us, why you might do it with your children, because food is so readily available and it kind of works, right? But then we learn from such an early age, oh, you're being loud, or you're frustrated, or you're acting out here, eat, distract yourself with food. Even though you're not hungry here, have a snack. Or how many of you learned never leave food on your plate? Or when you're a guest at someone's house for dinner, you have to eat whatever they serve you, even if you hate it, and clean your plate. When you go to a restaurant, you can't be wasteful. So make sure you eat all the food. And it's a special treat when you go to a restaurant. So of course you feel full. That's just what we do. When you watch TV, there's always snacks around. And when you watch movies on TV, you notice that, oh, well, when people are sad or they break up, They eat ice cream. And the women that do it, by the way, are like model size. And then you watch commercials where super slim women are eating pizza and drinking beer on the daily. And it's just something they do all the time. And you think I should be able to do that. We all know, logically, in the background, that actress is not eating those foods on the daily. And your parents or other adults teach you that people who are overweight are just lazy. So Make sure you're productive. And if you aren't productive all of the time, 24 hours a day, unless you're sleeping, you're doing life wrong, right? That whole comment, I can sleep when I'm dead. No. And then people comment on your weight, whether you lose weight or you gain weight, like, oh, wow, you put on a few pounds in college. Oh, wow, you look really good. You lost weight as if you didn't look good before when you had a little more weight on. Or "Mm, you really sure you want to be eating that? And you learn all of this stuff from a really early age. And then you diet. And when you're dieting, you learn you can't trust your own body. Someone else knows better what you should be eating. Someone else knows exactly what you should be eating. Not your own body, but someone else definitely knows. Three-year-old you could figure it out, but 30-year-old you, for whatever reason, all of a sudden can't. So you restrict yourself and you deprive yourself and you feel terrible and you eat really bland food that you hate. Meanwhile, your brain is obsessing about all of the food you quote unquote can't eat because it's not on your diet. You do all of this and you overactivate your fear response related to hunger. So much so that you worry that if you get quote unquote too hungry, you'll be out of control. Have you ever seen a three-year-old binge? Like, no. Even if they get really hungry and they kind of get whiny and they want to eat, they just eat and then they stop. But we do all of that when we diet and we have this really overactivated fear response related to hunger. And then you teach yourself, well, you know, I can't get too hungry. I better eat every two or three hours. Or you let yourself get hungry, but then eating is this like really big treat and reward for finally allowing your body to get hungry. And you diet. And you focus on losing weight so much that the scale makes or breaks your day, depending on whether it goes up or down. Because food is on your mind so much, then when you're stressed or you have a quote unquote bad day, you turn to food to relax. You use food to distract yourself from your own life. All of that crap is what makes intuitive eating hard. Your adult brain is all muddied up with all of this stuff. So then when you try intuitive eating, What is really happening is you are rebelling against your body because you tell yourself, I can have whatever I want, which is code for I can eat anything I've been restricting and depriving myself from, even if it isn't what my body wants. It's anything your brain wants with complete disregard for your body. I read an intuitive eating book and I did what she suggested, which was essentially wait until you're hungry. 
I was like, okay, I can do that. I'm kind of getting used to this hunger thing. And then the next step was, well, eat whatever you want until you're satisfied, right? Okay. Two parts of that are kind of getting to the intuitive eating part, right? Like eat when you're hungry, stop when you're satisfied, but the eat whatever you want when you have been dieting and when you have a diet brain and it's all muddied up and it's not that like clean instinctual way of eating that a three-year-old has, then when I'm like, all right, I'm hungry and I'm going to stop eating when I'm satisfied, but I get to eat whatever I want. My mind was like, ooh, sweets. I can do that. I like cookie dough. I ate cookie dough multiple times a day. And then I would have pizza and then I would have ice cream, right? The next time I was hungry. And by the way, I didn't let myself get too hungry because I still had a little fear around hunger. And I ate a whole load of other stuff that I can tell you, my body was not like, hey, thanks, Laura, for the cookie dough. Thanks for the pizza. Thanks for not really letting me get too hungry. And thanks for the ice cream. That's not intuitive eating. (laughs) Intuitive eating is listening to your body and what your body wants not listening to your diet brain that's on a free-for-all, rebelling against all the years of crap that you put it through. Eating ice cream and eating cookie dough and eating pizza is not intuitive eating when that's what you're eating on the daily. It's your diet brain trying to intuitively eat. Now, I want to be really clear. Intuitive eating is the destination. It is where I help all of my clients get to. But where you must start is where you are now and how you get to intuitive eating, how you get to back to how you ate when you were three years old, how you get to the place where you want to only eat when you're hungry, where you want to eat the food that both tastes good, that you enjoy, but that also fuels your body and feels comfortable in your body. And you want to easily stop when you're satisfied. That's intuitive eating. How you get there is you must unwind your diet brain. You must unwind and unlearn all of those years and maybe decades of thought patterns that don't serve you. And here's the amazing part. It can actually happen in a fraction of the time that it took you to learn them when you become aware of it. Because when you are unwinding all of that, the intuitive eating part, it's already there. Your brain and your body, that intuitive eating, that connection between your brain and your body, it already exists. Your brain and body want to experience the pleasure of food together. It's why your body feels bloated when you overeat. That's your intuitive eating cues trying to talk to your brain, but your brain is just like, "Mm -mm, not listening today, friends. So you have to come back to that innate pleasure match where your brain and your body are in sync and they're talking together so that when your body tells your brain, hey, I'm not hungry yet, your brain isn't thinking about food. And when your body tells your brain, hey, that food didn't really sit well, I don't know if I really want it again because I feel bloated and uncomfortable and heavy and I don't have energy, your brain listens and is like, oh, okay, we're not going to eat that again. And then when your body is trying to tell your brain with all the signals that it tells it, hey, we're satisfied. The food doesn't taste good anymore. My stomach's starting to feel full. If you keep eating, we're going to feel really uncomfortable. Your brain is also ready to listen. So when you come back to that way of eating, that's how intuitive eating becomes easy and effortless. The big part that is missing from a lot of intuitive eating is the understanding of exactly why each person wants to overeat in the first place. Your body does not want to overeat. Your brain does. So you must understand why your brain wants to and then change that so that you stop even wanting to. Now, there's only ever one reason that you want to overeat, but it shows up differently in each person's life, right? We're all different. We all have different brains. We all have different bodies. And so how this shows up can look different from person to person. A lot of times it looks similar, but sometimes it looks different. When you don't want to overeat, intuitive eating becomes the norm. It becomes effortless. But each person must understand her own brain and why she wants the food when she's not hungry in the first place so that she can learn to not even want the food when she isn't hungry and learn to only want the food that serves her body and learn to easily stop when she is satisfied. The only reason you deviate from intuitive eating is always because of an emotional experience. 
The food is a distraction mechanism. Overeating is a symptom of distracting yourself from an emotion you don't want to experience. The desire to eat and urge to eat, the panic to eat, restlessness, anxiety, stress, overwhelm, frantic, pressure, boredom, even excited, sadness, all common emotions that lead to overeating. This is what is missing from most of the intuitive eating, at least that I ever tried, is how to allow any emotion in your body without needing the distraction of food. Because when your brain isn't searching for a distraction, it will easily listen to your body and you will much more easily come back to that innate pleasure match where your brain and body want to experience the pleasure of food together. So think about this. You already allow emotions like feeling proud, feeling focused, feeling determined, feeling successful, feeling love, feeling joy, feeling fun. You allow those emotions in your body already. It's why you can feel super focused emotion while you are at work and have the hunger hormone ghrelin in your body, but your brain isn't thinking about food because you love feeling focused. So you don't need to distract yourself with food. Now compare that to a different scenario where you're at work, same amount of hunger hormone ghrelin in your body, but your boss just moves a deadline up on you and you just got the email about it and you're pissed. All of a sudden you notice your hunger or maybe you aren't even hungry at all and you eat for a momentary distraction from feeling pissed. You use the food to distract yourself from that emotion of pissed. So different than when you're feeling focused or you eat as a transition activity between tasks because of an emotion always. So certain emotions you already easily allow without wanting to distract yourself. So the skill then to make intuitive eating easy is to learn how to allow any emotion in your body without needing to distract yourself. Then you can easily listen to your body and eat in a way that truly serves you because you've understood exactly why you want to overeat in the first place. I'm going to go back to little kids for a minute. Think about kids and their emotions. They don't hold them in and they don't try to get out of them. They just play each and every one out. It just comes up and they react to it. Mad, throw something. Frustrated, yell. Happy, dance. Love, give you hugs. They don't need food to distract themselves from different emotions because they don't fight them. They don't resist them. And then the emotion just comes and it goes. Now, As adults, I'm not going to teach you to just react and throw things with all of your emotions. But what most of us think and learn is that certain emotions are okay to act from. Like it's okay to, and even really good to have determination and focus and to feel happy and playful and successful and take action from those emotions. It's okay to react to those emotions. But emotions like pissed, frustrated, pity, lazy, those are not okay to act from. So since you can't react and act from those quote unquote bad emotions that we learn, then what we learn in our society and as kids is that we need to hold them in and we need to fight with them. Holding them in and not acting them out is resisting them and it creates tension in your body. I experienced this so deeply as a child. I experienced quite a bit of anxiety And I knew it was something happening in my brain, but I had no idea exactly what was going on. And I knew if I acted it out, if I kind of let the anxiety play out, it would show up as like frustration and anger to other people because that's kind of what I was used to. That's what I had done in the past. And that was not acceptable. So when I felt the vibration of the emotion of anxiety in my body, I held it in. It's like my brain was saying, I see you anxiety, but I don't want you here. And so my body's experiencing anxiety and my brain is like, you're not supposed to be here. And they're fighting with each other. They're fighting with the reality that anxiety was actually present in my body. Remember, emotions are measurable. Scientists can measure the different vibrations of emotions in our body. They run in our nervous system with peptides that are released into our body. So they can actually measure different emotional experiences in our body. So I was resisting the fact that anxiety was present so much so that I created physical cramping in my legs and the cramping was so painful. My parents took me to an emergency room one time. And so 
when we learn that either you're allowed to react to quote unquote good emotions, but when you have a quote unquote bad or unacceptable emotion, you need to resist it. You never learn that you can allow an emotion in your body without resisting it and without reacting to it. There is that third option. It's not just resist it, react to it, but you can allow it without resisting and without reacting. It's a skill you can learn. It is so simple and it has changed my life. I hardly experience anxiety because when I'm not fighting with it and I allow it, and then sometimes it does show up, it just comes and it goes, or maybe it hangs around for a little bit, but it's not a problem because I allow it to be there and I don't resist it and I don't react to it. I'm going to give you one more example of the power of allowing emotion, which is something we spend a lot of time doing and developing that skill inside of the Naturally Thin for Life program because it is the key to intuitive eating. My husband and I were having a conversation and we didn't agree on something. And we don't really fight. Like we never really yell at each other. And of course we disagree, but not in the like yelling, being mean to each other type of way. So we're just having a conversation. I had an opinion. He had his opinion. And we just were not going to get to the place where we agreed. I tried to convince him it didn't work. It doesn't usually. And I had a thought in my brain that created a feeling of pissed in my body. Now, if I was going to react to being pissed, I probably would have yelled. That would have been my reaction from an emotion of pissed. If I was resisting pissed, kind of like, oh, pissed is here and it shouldn't be and he's doing this to me, I probably would have had an action, a behavior of storming off. But when I allowed pissed to just be in my body without reacting to it and without resisting it, I asked him some questions because I wanted to understand where he was coming from. And it didn't make the experience of being pissed like super fun. It's still a little uncomfortable, but it's like making peace with the presence of pissed in my body. And then what happened is a few minutes later, it was gone. And it wasn't gone because he agreed with me. It was gone because I just allowed it to come and go, right? And then I'm so much happier in how I showed up in that conversation. Because when you can allow an emotion in your body without trying to fight it, you don't need to distract yourself with either yelling or storming off or doing something else. And you definitely don't need to distract yourself with food. As long as you have that desire to distract yourself with food and you want to hit the tap out button from your life and food is that mechanism, intuitive eating will always be hard. When I am working with my clients, I teach them how to eat intuitively by retraining their brain to have a calm relationship with hunger, to only ever want to eat food that feels comfortable in their body, which when you truly listen to your body, that same food will be the food that creates weight loss. And then I teach them how to easily stop when they are satisfied. But that will never become easy until they also learn how to allow emotions in their body and how to stop wanting to eat to distract themselves from an emotional experience, when they stop wanting to distract themselves from being with themselves. And then from there, they learn how to also change their emotional experiences on purpose, to feel less anxious and feel more calm, to feel anxiety and feel a sense of calm with the anxiety, to stop feeling so restless, and also change their thought process for good to make eating intuitive effortless. Now the work, what makes it hard, the discomfort of becoming naturally thin is not the intuitive eating part. Your brain and body are designed for that. It truly is innate. The work to learn how to allow your emotions in your body without fighting them so you don't even want to overeat, that is the discomfort. And it's a very different discomfort than the willpower and the grit and the grind and the pressure and being really hard on yourself because it's unfamiliar. That's the only thing that makes it uncomfortable is that it's just something you're not used to doing. And a lot of us have learned like, nope, we just don't do feelings. Feelings are for weak people. Like I'm just not a feeling person. And so that is a lot of like what my work was is to be like, oh, actually, we're all feeling people all of the time. We always have an emotion in our body. 
And when I truly understood if I can be with an emotion and not want to distract myself from it, then that's the key to losing weight. So from there, I was like, I'm going to try this whole emotion thing. (laughs) In the beginning, inside of the program, we talk about naming different emotions. And when I started doing this work, I literally had to like Google all of the time, like names of emotions. My emotional vocabulary was quite limited because I kept telling myself, like, I just don't do emotions. I don't do emotions, even though, right? Like I was like, I love love and pride and successful and focus, right? also emotions. So when you learn to allow emotions in your body, then from there, you teach your brain new ways of thinking about yourself and learning how to be with yourself without food as entertainment. So yes, intuitive eating is the destination, but it only comes easily when you learn the skill of allowing emotion creating more emotions that you want on purpose, and then changing the thoughts in your brain to support that. In the Naturally Thin for Life program, I teach all of my clients five steps. There are five steps to become naturally thin. Two of them are focused on losing your fear around hunger, allowing your hunger, eating the food that serves you, stopping when you're satisfied, everything you need to know for your destination of intuitive eating. But more than half of the steps, three of the five steps are focused on everything else that makes intuitive eating difficult so that it becomes easy. Those other three steps are learning how to stop battling your emotions, learning how to allow them so you stop using food to distract yourself, and then learning how to evaluate your weight loss journey objectively without making the scale mean anything about you as a human, seeing it as data, and evaluating how specific foods feel in your body so that you learn how your body specifically talks to your brain specifically. And the fifth step is learning how to coach yourself, which means how to understand your brain specifically so that you always know what makes those intuitive eating steps difficult. And then you have all of the tools to change anything going on in your brain that makes those difficult so that it becomes easy, so that your brain starts to really serve your body. Your brain starts to become your biggest asset rather than your biggest obstacle. So yes, intuitive eating is where you end up, but it comes so much more easily when you learn the other skills to unwind all of that crap we learn between that three-year-old and the next couple of decades. So we are doing a special bonus inside of the Naturally Thin for Life program in the month of April. So this podcast will come out in the first week of April, so it isn't too late to join us for this live. I am teaching a live bonus course called Debunking Myths inside of the program where I'm going to be teaching you the nine myths that I see over and over and over again that halt or slow down your permanent weight loss. These nine myths are part of all of that crap that we learn, and it's essential to unlearn each of them in order to be naturally thin for life. So I'm teaching each of these nine myths, and then there will be nine live calls where you can come and get any questions answered related to each myth to help you move forward in your weight loss journey. This is only going to be taught live in April. So that's April 2021 for all of you listening in the future. And you get this as a part of your membership when you join. So if you're already in the Naturally Thin for Life program, you automatically get access to all of this in addition to everything you've already received. So when you join Naturally Thin for Life, you get immediate access to the five-step Naturally Thin for Life process, access to live weekly support calls, and you also get access to this bonus debunking myths course that I will be teaching live in April. So make sure to join live so you can get your specific questions answered. But even if you listen to this episode months or years later into the future, this bonus course will still be available. It will all be on replay. So everything that I teach live will be available for you in a replay format when you join, if you join after April 2021. Listen to the outro for more information on how to join. And I can't wait to see you inside. Have an amazing day, my friends. I will talk with you all next week. Friend, if you are loving what you are learning here on the podcast, you have to come check out my Naturally Thin for Life program. It is my on-demand lifetime access program where I teach you brand new concepts not taught here on the podcast 
and I will walk you through exactly how to implement all of the tools I teach you here so that they become just a part of you. You will learn exactly how to understand your specific brain and your specific body so that you become naturally thin for the rest of your life and you no longer struggle with your weight. Inside of the Naturally Thin for Life program, you can also receive live help so that you consistently make progress and reach your goal. I will teach you how to accelerate your naturally thin journey in a sustainable way so that the change becomes permanent. The best part is that it's risk-free. You either love it or I will give you your money back. If you are ready to finally be naturally thin for life, join us at lauradixoncoaching.com forward slash work with me. That's L-A-U-R-A-D-I-X-O-N coaching.com and click on the work with me tab. I cannot wait to see you there.